Welcome everybody to our webinar, Integration for Planet Satellite Imagery. This is part one of two. Um, next week is part of the Back to FME School series. We're going to talk about integration for other remote sensing imagery as well, including Landsat, uh, Sentinel, and other free and paid providers. My name is Tiana. And my name is Dmitri. And we have Alex from Planet joining us from San Francisco. Um, we've also got our remote sensing experts, Jen and Dave, on Q&A. So if you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please type them into the question box in GoToWebinar um, or tweet them. We love Twitter. So today we're going to talk about remote sensing data offered by Planet and what you can do with it. Um, first, Alex will take us through what Planet offers through its various satellite constellations. And then I will go through how you can use FME to integrate this imagery with other data sources. And we'll build a simple but very powerful workflow. And then Dimitri is going to show you a couple of more advanced demos, which should provide some amazing inspiration as to what's possible with satellite imagery. So remote sensing is evolving rapidly. In the last few years, we've gone from having the occasional low resolution image to continuous images of the entire Earth in extremely precise detail. And these aren't just photographs, they are, um, each image has bands of information beyond the color spectrum. So we can use that to analyze what each image contains. And with so much of this up-to-date imagery available, a lot of different industries are finding new opportunities. Um, we're seeing a lot of governments, intelligence, anyone who needs to visualize resources and land use. Um, and we're also seeing the benefits for anything that needs to track vegetation because you can make use of the infrared bands and this is something we're going to show you how to do shortly. So first we're going to hand the mic over to Alex to tell us about what planets satellites have to offer um, and the applications across all of these industries. Thank you Tiana, thank you Dimitri and the SAFE software team for, um, yeah, for bringing uh, planet into this uh, webinar series. Um, we're very uh, honored to be able to participate. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I have a section that I'll talk about um, where we are today um, as well as where the direction we're going in. Um, and, and I think it'll help, um, help in, inspire ideas and as well as segue into some of the cool demos that Dimitri will be showing. Um, so the way we think of it, just to provide some context, is that we really believe that we're, we're in this um, global sensing revolution. What do I mean by that? Well, for one, access to space has become increasingly um, you know, easier, affordable, um, and there's just many, many more routes, diverse routes, to getting into space. And that's how we've been able to really uh, introduce a lot of a variety set of technologies and remote sensing capabilities. Um, and then the other piece is the pro pro proliferation of sensors. Um, we have sensors, we each have a variety of sensors in our pockets already. And we're utilizing a lot of these sensors and a lot of the um, just Moore's law and how a lot of this technology has sped up and as well as diversified and leveraging all that sensor technology uh, to be able to capture more data from another angle. The other piece is the commoditization or the consumerization of IT. Um, I mentioned Moore's Law, but we've seen this across a lot of um, processing power, a lot of compute power, a lot of storage. Storage costs, compute speeds have rapidly um, been increasing as well as costs going down. A lot of this has allowed for us to really kind of piece every part of this puzzle together um, to really have more understanding and transparency about what is happening in our planet. So at Planet, our mission is to image the whole world every single day to make global change visible, accessible, and actionable. And so why do we do this? One reason, a few reasons are because, you know, historically, there's just been um, a lack of data. Not to say that this data didn't exist, but in a, when you need it in a timely manner or when you need you know, an extensive archive for training, for example, 
um, there hasn't been um, you know gaps that have been met in specific areas. And so our whole approach is to provide global daily coverage. Um, and there's been limited analytics. You know, we hear it's hard to go through a day without hearing about another machine learning, deep learning uh, startup or some other machine learning capability or even existing companies that are trying to build out their own um, artificial intelligence capabilities. Well, a lot of that capability has been driven by you know, a lot of a variety of other data sets, mostly around social data. A lot of it's driven by exactly what I mentioned before, the pro prolifer proliferation of sensors and the data that's being collected. Um, however, we haven't seen the full potential of some of these analytics being brought to the uh, geospatial industry yet, um, mostly because of the first this first point of having an extensive um, archive, consistent archive of data to train these analytics on. And the third piece is just access. Um, a lot of this, again, was for historical reasons because of uh, because of the IT infrastructure that hadn't yet um, caught up. Uh, but now with the a lot of the lowering cost in compute and the increase in processing speeds that allow for the access of terabytes and terabytes of data, um, we're seeing that access is becoming better. But these are some of the factors that have kind of um, uh, in, you know, infected some of the historical approaches and really kind of uh, realizing the full potential of geospatial data. And so our whole approach at Planet is to provide global coverage. We want to um, image the entire landmass of the Earth, and in fact, we're actually imaging um, a few open water areas as well. Um, we're also providing frequent uh, revisits, so it's this persistent monitoring approach. Where we're imaging the entire world every single day, so you will have uh, an image of every spot on the planet every single day within 24 hours. We're making it super easy to access um, imagery. Um, so the moment in which an image is captured in space, it will be published and it will be available through a variety of interfaces, um, through an API, through a web browser, and ideally through um, third-party applications and integrators like FME um, within 24 hours. And then we also have an extensive archive. So we have rapid eye imagery that dates back to 2009, um, and we also have um, a lot of imagery, a lot of archive imagery from our recent acquisition of SkySat as well. Um, so this is exactly what I meant around having just um, not just this frequent global coverage, but also having this extensive archive in a lot of different locations that you could actually also train um, train your analytics on. Um, so how are we doing? Well, I want to show a couple videos that show our recent progress. So this is a video of our launch of 88 satellites earlier this year in February um, off of the ISRO, working with the ISRO team. And um, so yeah, that's, that was a little bit of a fast forward video of literally our satellites being um, ejected into space. They hooked up a camera next to the rocket. Um, this is actually our most recent launch, I think back in July of about 48 satellites. We actually had a, one of our Dove satellites positioned to angle um, and basically capture uh, repeated frames of the Soyuz rocket that was carrying more of our satellites and being launched. So that was another cool angle um, captured by our own satellite. So now we have uh, 190 uh, planet satellites, Dove satellites that are orbiting our planet. And um, this is just like a snapshot, a visualization of kind of how they're kind of orbiting our planet. Um, what does this look like, you know, going into the future? So we're um, well on our way to imaging over 150 million square kilometers per day. Um, so that is over uh, more than the entire landmass of the planet every single day. Um, so this is, we're in the process of commissioning uh, the remaining 48 of the satellites, basically just positioning into their respective locations, which takes a couple months. But 
entering into 2018, we will be um, we will have achieved our our goal of imaging the entire world every single day. So this is a, a nice snapshot of just all of the different assets, um, our network of constellations that we do have in space. So we have five rapid eye satellites, 190 Dove satellites, seven SkySat satellites with the acquisition of, of Terabella, and uh, with six more to be launched later this year. Um, so with all this data, now with our satellite constellation, we're really focusing a lot of our efforts on our platform now. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our platform as it is today. So this captures you know, all the different imagery and data that we are delivering through our platform. So in addition to planet-owned um, satellites and sensors, we also serve uh, Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2. And so with, um, it sounds like in the next series of this webinar, you'll be talking about other data sets. Um, we also, you know, it's it's our goal to also provide you know other data sets in here as well, especially the, some of the free ones. So we started with Landsat A and Sentinel Two, um, so you can also access that imagery. But with PlanetScope, SkySat, and RapidEye, it's um, four band imagery, medium resolution for PlanetScope and RapidEye. RapidEye has, in addition to RGB and near IR, they also have Red Edge, uh, primarily for precision ag. Um, and then for SkySat, it's a sub-meter resolution, also four-band imagery. Some of the features that are available um, in our platform today is, you know, it's primarily designed for, you know, search and discovery and querying our data. Um, so you can add filters, you can um, save specific searches uh, relevant to your AOI, compare imagery um, over over a time series. Um, so it's mainly designed for kind of that querying and, and access of imagery. And that's the first problem, first set of challenges we really wanted to solve with our platform. But with the data, so in addition to the imagery itself, um, the image items itself, we also provide base maps. Um, so we have a automated our own um, mosaic and algorithm that that provides both monthly and quarterly mosaics by piecing together um, imagery from both of those respective time frames into a single layer and we have our own color correction our own um, our own cloud removal models uh, that kind of pr produce this uh, single layer of the entire world and if you go into the planet explorer which i'll show um, a quick screenshot of and a couple slides, you can actually see um, all of our quarterly and monthly mosaics, and that's openly available that people can kind of um, just kind of browse around. And uh, you'll notice that we we've also have um, we have August um, monthly base map already in there. Um, so this is again a completely automated approach, which which is what allows us to quickly and eff efficiently. Uh, not only stitch together and mosaic all that imagery, but then um, make it available. And then with each um, imagery asset that we we collect, every uh, imagery product that we collect, we also provide a variety of assets. Um, so not only do we provide a visual image of that um, of that um, item, imagery item, but we also provide an analytic version that includes all the additional bands. Um, uh, UDM, unusable data mask, uh, to basically, if you wanted to quickly remove um, and spatially um, have a spatial representation of clouds or maybe anomalous pixels, it will all be captured in that mask. Um, we also provide um, a basic format of our imagery that's a less rectified, uh, unrectified version of our imagery where if you have your own orthorectification algorithm, um, your own uh, color correction process, your own DIM models that you want to you want to bring to our imagery. You're welcome to do that, and you can access that format as well. Um, so these these are just quick examples of you know a false color composite layer on top of you utilizing our near IR capability. Great for um, a lot of our ag uh, ag users, and then a, a spatial representation of the unusable data mass. So um, it's a raster geotiff that 
covers that outlines the the clouds that we detect um, as well as any anomalous pixels. Um, a little quick sample of our SkySat imagery as well of Montreal, Canada. You can see the detail in a lot of these buildings and parking lots and you can see shadows as well. So our, our whole system right now is built and designed for scale. So all the way from our satellites um, in orbit to our ground stations, we have approximately 25 ground stations around the world, which is what allows us to um, frequently uh, downlink all this imagery and then publish it um, to, our, to our API. And so right now we're publishing about um, over a million images per day. And then we have thousands of virtual machines and workers are um, processing and running jobs to, to um, run all the image processing tasks that we have on our, on our imagery and then spit out the different um, assets and imagery item types that we have. So we're, we're processing and publishing um, over 10 terabytes of data per day. And then we make that available through a variety of interfaces, through our API, through our GUI browser. Um, again, this entire process is done with um, no human in the loop. So it's completely automated. Um, some examples of some of the image processing that we provide, and this is all available in our in detail in our documentation, but we provide flat field correction, radiometric calibration, ultra rectification, color correction, um, as well as the publication of all the variety of assets and imagery types. I mentioned this because it leads into uh, the direction that we're going in in our platform, and I'll get to that in the in the next few slides. But I wanted to tease this um, this layout here because. This is this middle part is where we're um, creating and re-architecting a lot of our platform to to have um, the, a lot of these image processing tasks um, as as operations and jobs that run that are supported by this new platform that um, can also in the future support other kinds of analytics and so a lot of things that um, the FMET team and a lot of integrations that they've been doing, um, you can imagine having some of those kinds of operations, some of those tasks also being done you know, within our platform. Um, and so in the same way, we want to make a lot of those operations that are being done right now, most of these operations, again, are just image processing um, tasks. Um, but we also want to make them available and accessible through, through our GUI, through our API, as well as through third-party applications. Um, so this is a quick view of the Planet Explorer. Um, this is, I believe, Safe Software's headquarters is somewhere in this uh, in this image in Surrey, Canada. Um, but yeah, that you can see, I took this uh, right before right before the the weekend. You can see just like how recent uh, of a capture this image is. And we make a lot of all this information available through our documentation. One part I wanted to highlight is that we have a developer resources section in here where you can, we provide quick tutorials, quick guides, um, different libraries where you can run your own analysis on our data. You can do NDVI, you can, we have a really um, quick uh, ship detection tool if you wanna, if you wanna play around with um, an open source algorithm that that detect ships, but we make it really um, plug and play for you to um, do that analysis and just get familiar with our data. Um, so the net, this last section, I just want to talk about the direction and you know inspire um, the imagination of the audience and you know what they can do with our data. So I already mentioned at this very top that you know we're we're collecting and just building a larger and larger training data set. Um, so we have a global daily coverage. We have this extensive archive. And for a lot of um, developers and companies out there, view this as you know, a training data set, view this as a data set to really make cool integrations that show you know, what's happening around our planet. Um, on top of that, um, we're building more and more platform capabilities to leverage the power of this growing archive of data. And we'll continue to make you know speed and scale accessible because when you talk about 
frequent, you know, revisit, timely data, um, speed and scale is becomes, you know, increasingly important. So imagine um, in a humanitarian situation, or even just imagine the recent hurricanes that have been hitting, um, timely response is of the essence. So we will, we're continuing to, you know, invest and increase our, our capabilities around speed and scale. All of this is leading to um, enabling more analytic and business intelligence. And so with Earth, Earth observation, the way we view of view this is that we want to go from observation to to modeling and so again with with our focus um you know as of now has been on around searching browsing discovering access what that allows you to do is find out you know what happened you know in the past it allows you to find out you know so in this hurricane example you can kind of look at before and after images do analysis um, understand the extent of damage it allows you to uh, find out what happened in the past now we're moving in what we want to enable others to focus on you know identifying and measuring um, and we, we view that as um, you know being able to understand what's happening you know in the present um, and all of this we we view it as a means to, to train and predict and really understand what's happening, what's going to happen in the future. So again, the search and access, we believe it focuses on you know, what happened in the past. Uh, help me understand the past so I can prepare for the present and prepare for the future. Um, identify and measure what's happening at this moment. Um, what is happening? Um, how, many of us, how many objects or how many events have occurred um, or are occurring so I can understand what is happening uh, today and all this is to enable you know training and prediction and forecasting for what may happen in the future an example of this and i'll i'll end off with just a few examples of you know capabilities and demos that you know we've been doing as well as what our partners have been doing as well um, so this is an example of something that uh, we were just kind of looking at to see if our imagery can detect um, oil well pad progress um, in the Permian Basin. Um, so we can clearly see that we can we can see progress. Um, and again, this is um, enabled through a, a frequent revisit of our data. You can see uh, not just that these well pad areas are changing, but uh, you can see a lot of the detail. And this is actually a view of a SkySat image where you can see that detail. Um, this is what one of our partners have been doing to uh, run their algorithm on a on um, the road a road detection algorithm on different areas um, around the world and you can kind of see even with 3.5 meter resolution data you can have a pretty accurate uh, road detection um, and they apply this uh, to roads and buildings and they apply it on various areas around the world and one of my favorites was um, in Rio they looked at post-Olympic er, uh, areas, um, specifically at different facilities, and saw that a lot were um, a lot of those facilities were changing after after Olympics, and they built some alerts to kind of trigger when they detected some of these changes were happening. Um, another one of our partners was looking at um, our imagery to detect. Uh, so residential solar panel trends, and they were able to come up with roughly 90% uh, accuracy when tested against some, some baseline data. And another partner was also looking at um, the recent British Columbia wildfires. And um, in this, the thing I love about this example is they were doing this uh, literally about a week after it was happening and they estimated um, over 700 square kilometers of damage around a lot of these transmission lines and uh, natural gas pipelines across five different locations. And what's really powerful about this is, you know, as we, as we really um, kind of improve and iterate on these kinds of analytics, um, in the absence of ground truth, this becomes um, baseline data. This becomes your only source of 
uh, truth at the moment, um, especially when it comes to having a timely reference point of what is happening. Uh, so this becomes like, you know, a reference point in which everyone can kind of work on and we can continue to improve uh, the analytics and analysis. But um, this is the first, you know, assessment of what is actually happening with the damages has been caused. And then, you know, I don't want to steal uh, Dimitri's thunder, but, you know, I want to tease that we've been working a lot with SAFE, um, with the FME team to really build a lot of really great integrations. Um, we view FME as their great evangelists of what can be done with our data. So there's a variety of examples. I'll let Dimitri go into a lot more detail about um, some of the stuff that they've created. Um, but, you know, everything from merging other data sets together to um, quickly seeing and piecing together um, a time series of imagery to really understand how land is changing. Um, those are all great examples of what uh, this, what the team has been doing to really showcase um, not just, um, you know, the FME, the power of FME, but also what uh, a lot of these data sets can do when you merge a lot of data together. Um, so our whole goal, again, is to enable analytic value. That's how we're um, um, building in direction of our, our platform and uh, a lot of the capabilities that we're introducing into our platform. So that's really um, what we view as the potential of having, you know, being able to image the entire world every single day is to allow for uh, this, um, this kind of analysis to happen. And I'd be remiss by just, I just want to leave um, in my section with this is that, you know, again, I want to inspire the audience um, to, you know, get access to our data. You can get access to a global daily da uh, data set for free as a trial by going to this URL. Um, so you can play around with our data. Um, if you're interested in partnering with us, uh, join our application developer program. Um, so with that, I'll, I want to hand it back to the SAFE software team. Um, and again, yeah, thank you. And I'll be on for questions afterwards. Okay, thanks so much, Alex. Uh, let me switch back here. Awesome. So now we're going to look at some integrations that you can do with Planet Imagery. Um, first off, for those of you who are new to FME, um, what is it? So FME is here to help you connect data from different systems and transform it in any way that you need. So this is done by building a workflow in a drag and drop interface. Um, you can see here on the right, this is Workbench. So you can see the path from source to transformations to destination. And Planet is one of the hundreds of sources you can pull data from. So once you've connected to it, you can use um, FME's 400 plus transformers to process it. And then you can run your workflows again and again. And we're going to be looking at um, how to set up triggers and other automations shortly. So let's see Workbench in action. Um, I have this RGB image, which was taken in August by the PlanetScope satellites. And it's an area of the Sequoia National Forest in California. So the problem is that it doesn't tell me much about vegetation or elevation or anything. Um, I can make some guesses, but I'd like to have a more accurate model. So what I'd like to do is process the bands so that we can see the vegetation as a near infrared image. And then I'm going to get a digital elevation model of the same area and combine these so that I get a 3D model of the landscape. So my goal then is to build a useful 3D model from raw satellite images. Um, the workflow has to get these images from planet, um, combine the bands to give me a near infrared image, get a digital elevation model, and convert that to 3D, and then combine the image and the 3D model. So let's move over to Workbench. So the first thing you do is uh, pull the planet imagery into your workflow. If you type anywhere on the canvas in FME, it brings up what you want. So if I start to type planet, um, it'll give me the planet reader. So you open the parameters to specify what you want to get. Um, it's first gonna ask for my API key. So I'll enter the free one that I got when I signed up for my planet trial. And then item type, I will get a planet scope ortho tile. 
assets. Um, so I want a four band image that has the infrared band. So I'm gonna get analytic. And then the date range. Um, my image was taken in August from the 1st to the 15th. So I'll choose that. Um, JSON I won't use here, but you can use it if you want to make advanced queries, um, like to filter for cloud coverage or empty pixels. And then the last part we care about down here is the search envelope. Um, I entered these earlier and just clicked save as my defaults to save a bit of time. But this is an area over the Sequoia National Forest. I'm the same one that you just saw in that picture. So that's what we need to get. Um, so I'll click OK. And then the first transformation we're going to do is um, we're going to prepare to mosaic together all of the images retrieved over this date range. So for that, we use a raster band no data setter. And you can double click to open the parameters. So if I set this to zero, that means any pixels that are black are going to be treated as having no data. Um, so we're going to end up ignoring these in our processing. So that's great. So next we need a raster mosaicer. And this is going to mosaic together all of the images that we get. So if I open this, we get a lot of parameters here, but the only one I care about right now is how to deal with overlapping pixels. So given this stack of images from Planet, um, pixel by pixel, we can decide which one we want to show. So if I choose minimum, we're telling it to use the lowest value, so that's the darkest pixel. And that means we are going to end up minimizing cloud coverage. So now uh, we get the images and then we set no data and then we mosaic. So we end up with a mosaic of all the images uh, we've gotten from the satellites. So next step is to turn it into a near infrared image. Um, for any type of band processing like this, we have a powerful transformer called the raster expression evaluator. So we'll use that. Um, in the parameters, we can set the RGB values of the output image to whatever we want. So we're going to set um, red 16, green 16, and blue. So 16 uh, is for 16-bit color. So to access bands in FME, we use array syntax. Um, you might be familiar with that if you um, have any experience with coding, but it looks like this. So A3, this is the fourth band. Um, I know from looking at the Planet Scope documentation on Planet's website that this is the infrared band. So we're gonna set red 16, um, that value to show the infrared band. And then green is uh, gets a two, blue a one. So this is going to give us a near infrared image for the output. Um, and I know from trying this demo earlier that the output ends up pretty dark. So what I'm going to do is um, multiply each of these by four just to do a bit of color correction on the output. So we'll just add a factor of four to each of them. So you can see, um, you know, if you open uh, this editor here, you can do really powerful um, expressions with the raster expression evaluator. Um, this is this one's pretty simple. Okay, so that'll give us um, the near infrared image as the output. So next we need to get the digital elevation model of the same area. Um, for this, we're going to use MapZen. Map Zen. So this is a free database of digital elevation models made available by Amazon AWS. And if you start typing MapZen, uh, on the canvas. You'll see we have this reader here and also a custom transformer. Um, I'm going to use the custom transformer because Dimitri made it and he's sitting beside me. So there we go. Um, okay, so from the DM, we're going to get a 3D surface model. Um, this is just a matter of adding a surface modeler and that's it. So Ebony is going to do the work for us there. Um, so that connects to point lines. Okay. 
Um, so now up here we have a near infrared image, and then down here we have a 3D model for the same area. So the final step is to drape the image over the 3D model. And, oh, thank you. Yeah. So yeah, this just automatically connected to the rejected port, which is not good. I want it to connect to the output port so that we actually get some data coming through there. Um, appearance. Uh, appearance. Oh my God, I can't type. Setter. Okay, there. Um, so this sets the appearance of a geometry object. So I'm going to put the raster through appearance, and then geometry gets the tin surface. Um, finally, we specify the output. And we could write to PDF or OBJ or whatever we want, but in this case, I'm just going to write. I'm going to connect inspector, and this will send it to the FME data inspector so that we can um, look at it and pan around and um, see all the values. So this is our entire workspace here. Um, I Let me run that so it can go in the background. So basically, we're getting all the planet images over a date range, um, setting no data values so that we ignore empty pixels. Um, we are mosaicing all of those images together into one big nice square. We're making a near infrared image. Um, at the same time here we're getting a digital elevation model from Mount Zen of the same area. And then we're converting that into a 3D surface model. And then we're draping the near infrared image over our 3D model and then we're sending that to the data inspector. Look good to you, Dimitri. Okay, he's nodding. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I think while this runs, I'll give it a second. So FME and Planet will cache images if you ran it um, recently. I ran this yesterday afternoon, so it should still be cached, I think. Yeah, but it does not look like it takes it from your cache. So it so may take a while. Pulling uh, it from the cloud. Yeah, so uh, downloading images from Planet uh, takes some time. So activation time and uh, on the Planet side, and then uh, the actual download. Once you do it, we ca uh, once FME does it, it caches it locally. So you can rerun the workspaces without using your quotas uh, against uh, Planet uh, uh, servers. So you will be just using your local copy. So, but it looks like today we are downloading the new, the new uh, imagery. Okay. Um, while this is running, we can look at, so on the left here, you can see the workspace parameters. So we've got these published parameters and we're going to look at this shortly um, when Dimitri shows you automation scenarios, but you can make um, publish. So if we make a user parameter here, this will um, essentially, you can ask the user, whoever's running the workspace for input. Um, and then that kind of helps with running things if you make a web page or something. So you've got a couple web pages to show people, right? Yeah. Yeah. I could jump back. Oh, this is almost done. I'll jump back to the slides while it goes. Do you have anything else to show for the full page? Uh, um, maybe we can show the, uh, or is it? Oh, yeah, we're almost done. Basically done. Yeah. You can see the numbers coming through the workspace here, so that really helps. Um, so there were eight images downloaded from Planet, and then that went through, and you can see after the mosaicer, I have one, which is the intended output. And then here I have my digital elevation model coming through, and then now it's setting the appearance on that. And it's doing some intermediate processing in the log window down here. You can see what's happening. So it's almost done, and now we're looking at the data inspector. That is tiny. Make that a bit bigger. Okay, so this looks a little bit more helpful in this image. Um, I can see that the landscape is still pretty dead, but maybe not quite as dead as I thought because the red all shows me that there is some vegetation in those mountain ranges somewhere. Oh, it's being glitchy. Anyway, so yeah, you can see there's a bit of vegetation going on. The 3D-ness is really cool. I can see how high the mountains are. So yeah, pretty cool. And next week, we will be talking about, about uh, vegetation and it, health and why red represents uh, healthy mm. vegetation. So uh, please uh, don't forget to join us next week. Yeah. So now that you know how to use Planet in FME, 
Um, you can start to imagine all the possibilities. So you can create up-to-date satellite maps that use the latest imagery from Planet. Um, you can pull in any other sources like 3D models, GIS data, live feeds, whatever you have. We're going to look at this uh, image pretty soon. Um, load imagery into existing systems. So if you have existing databases or archives or business intelligence tools, you can automatically get them there. You can use FME's transformers to analyze and process the images. So like I said, FME has over 400 built in and over 50 of these are designed specifically to work with rasters. And then we've also got custom transformers in the FME hub um, so that the MapZem is uh, one of them, and these are built by other FME users and our developers too. So you can browse all of the custom transformers um, if you go to hub.safe.com. One example of a custom transformer that Dimitri also built is the NDVI calculator. Um, this is a useful one for analyzing vegetation. And this is, um, yeah, like I said, something we'll go into more detail on in next week's remote sensing webinar. So here's a pro tip for you. Um, the feature reader is a transformer that's essentially a reader in the middle of your workflow. So if you need to do any pre-processing, you can do all of that and then get the planet data um, using this transformer. So for example, you could get parameters from the user or build a JSON query um, or a read GIS boundary, and then pass it into the feature reader and get planet images based on those parameters. So instead of typing the coordinates, uh, as you saw in Tiana's example, you can make uh, your geometries uh, to define what should be downloaded. So, downloaded. so in this case, you just type the name of the county and uh, its geometry will uh, go to planet uh, servers and read the, the, the data for you. Uh, and in this example, you can see two feature readers. So uh, you saw a variety of uh, products uh, delivered by planets. So, uh, first, we try to read planet scope data. And if there is no luck, we don't have anything on that date. Uh, we can try reading uh, rapid eye images. And you can, you can imagine we can uh, expand this example. So just fall back if you don't have any rapid eye imagery. Read Sentinel or Skybox. Or if nothing helps, then, well, try reading Landsat. And after that, well, OK, try, try maybe next day. So uh, that's how it may look like uh, with feature readers. Yeah, so let's use what we know about the feature reader and awesome transformations available, um, and we'll build a really powerful workflow. So should I make you the presenter now? Yeah, OK. Yeah, let's do that. OK. I would like to show you this uh, example I worked on recently, where I made a georeferenced uh, video on top of planet base map and you can see uh, so I can pan and I can zoom and uh, see the video running on top of the, the base map so and uh, um, why I like this example we can see how the vegetation you know, changes from well it stayed in January uh, as video progresses to August and I, I never saw California well, green <laughs> because I always go there for the conferences uh, in summer uh, so, but yeah, that's that's an example. Um, it takes about 100 transformers to, to make this one. So uh, it's a pretty complicated one, but I think this is really, really impressive. And you can imagine some interesting scenarios uh, with uh, this video. Imagine any, you know, humanitarian situation or a, a disaster uh, or uh, or construction site, you know, or over, over a period of time. Uh, shown on the map like this. So uh, now I'm going to show you another example we already show, uh, saw uh, the screenshots. Uh, so this one, is, um, it's a base map, uh, your own base map, which uh, combines both uh, the planet imagery and a vector layer uh, uh, rasterized on top of it. So uh, what is interesting here, so uh, we build a workspace that goes uh into uh, the, the the planet database and daily and checks whether anything new is available downloads it and then 
process it and uh, makes you a map of uh, San Francisco transit system. And it can be available for you, uh, well, as soon as, as, as something new uh, arrives, you can update your data. So I will show you the workspace. So here it is. So here we try to read, uh, as we already showed you, um, the area over San Francisco, uh, the bounding box. Uh, we try to read planet scope uh, images. And then, as I explained before, uh, if uh, we don't have any pla any planet scope images, we read. Uh, we try reading uh, pl uh, rapid eye images, and then uh, we mosaic everything together, clip to original binding box, and um, then, if we don't have a hundred percent coverage, we read the previous mosaic. Make sure that the previous mosaic is uh, below the new imagery in this sorter. And then we mosaic them together and save it for future use. So that's basically how we get the up-to-date uh, mosaic, uh, up-to-date image for the, for the area of our interest. Uh, the rest uh, is basically just reading some data from directly from San Francisco, from San Francisco Transit Authorities. So you can see here I'm reading general transit feed specification format uh, designed for uh, storing uh, transit data information. And here you can see the URL. So I don't have any locally saved data. Uh, we read it directly from the uh, website, from uh, the Transit Authorities website. And it means that whenever they have a new uh, version of their of, of their data, it will be read directly from there. And then the rest is just uh, making a nice map uh, with map necrasterizer here and tiling it to uh, make uh, web tiles which are available in your browser and saving the data, the PNG tiles to uh, either locally or some web storage. So, and this is the result. Uh, here it is. So. You can see the freshest uh, transit map on top of the freshest imagery available for for us. So, uh, and as you can see here, the, uh, we have here a, a download button. This example is available, and you can try it yourself. So, um, another example I would like to show you. Uh, it shows some clouds, and that's probably a question for Alex. Why? Uh, our JSON filter didn't work on this image, but uh, uh, this example shows you how we can collect uh, some data over time and make it uh, quickly, instantly available to any user who would like to uh, monitor a situation over a certain area. So we'll specify a, a range of dates, say between, so let's just have a look at the, uh, at the summer month from, July, uh, from June to, uh, to date. And we'll submit this request and get back uh, this page with all the imagery available uh, throughout the summer with the dates. Uh, and now we can compare two images together. Let me take maybe this one, the September 1st. And by the way, uh, check the dates. So September 1st, August 31st, August 30th. So uh, it's not uh, daily coverage just yet, but we are getting really close to that. Uh, and then don't forget that sometimes we have clouds over uh, our uh, areas, over our planet, and maybe we just didn't have any, uh, any images available uh, with no clouds. So I can compare uh, how the, the vegetation looked like in, say, end of July. So here I have two representations. Uh, do I? Yes. Uh, and you can see my slider here going back and forth. I also can change the representation, representation to infrared. And you can see what the, the, the healthy vegetation means. In infrared, it's much brighter red. Or you can switch to NDVI and compare these images. Or you compare um, NDVI versus NDVI and see where uh, where everything is going. Uh, and we have to give a shout yeah. out to Greg Patterson, right, for the script. For yes. The, the slide yes. Script. Yeah. 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 So thanks, Greg. Yeah. So, and uh, I'm going to show you the workspace for that, which looks maybe a, a little bit 
scary so for, for data collection but uh, the, it's it's really a pretty pretty simple once you know uh, how it works uh, here we just uh, decide what we really need uh, whether the cloud coverage and data coverage uh, satisfies uh, our conditions and then we download the visual assets rgb images here and analytic uh, assets and build several products just keep a simple rgb image in this stream uh, then we make an infra infrared image either for, for rapid eye or planet scope uh, because rapid eye has five bands and planet scope has four so that's why i need two different expression evaluators and here i make an ndvi index and then all of that goes to uh, s3 folder uh, on amazon uh, and i will show you the folder there so this is how it is all stored on Amazon. So uh, those are just PNG files uh, with URLs, and you can very quickly access them just instantly. Uh, you can see how uh, quickly everything changes uh, once I click on, on these buttons. So, and you can monitor the situation uh, and uh, make some estimates or, uh, you know, maybe uh, some analysis based, based on what is going on with your uh, crops with your with your fields. So uh, the page that actually delivers this this uh, uh, is, is much much simpler. So that's that's the whole workspace where basically I just go to S3 uh, storage and list all the files, all the available files, and uh, build an HTML page uh, in here. Just create an HTML page, which then is delivered to you in your browser so this is a workspace you can see it here fmw extension if we go back to this example we don't see an html here it's not an html page it's a workspace that shows you as an html page and here we see our published parameters so show me everything from this date to this date and we get uh, this page is generated by the workspace and streamed back to your browser so awesome. yeah, I think now we can switch back to uh, yeah. our slides. So tell me, how do you, what do you use to automatically get those images on a schedule, or? Yeah. So stories? basically, I take I take this. Um, no, there was supposed to be like a two-word answer. I use FME Cloud. I. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, this works uh, space lives uh, in uh, FME Cloud mm -hmm. and I create a schedule to run it daily and it runs daily and uh, basically it keeps uh, uh, filling uh, my database with new imagery every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for any sort of automation scenario, uh, we have FME Server and you can deploy FME Server on premises or in the cloud. Um, and if you're deploying in the cloud, that's what FME Cloud is for. So I just want to show you um, a couple of scenarios here. Um, oh yeah, so if if you publish remote sensing workspaces to FME Cloud, um, you're going to get better performance. The idea is that you should do your processing close to the data. So for satellite imagery that's stored in the cloud, um, it makes sense you want to run your workspaces in the cloud as well. Um, yeah, so just a tip for performance gains there. So a quick overview of some automation scenarios you can set up with FME Cloud. Um, scheduling, like we saw, you can deliver images on a schedule um, or update a background map at regular intervals. Um, triggers, you can set up a trigger, say with Dropbox or email, to launch an action whenever new images are available. And then we've got notifications. Um, you can check if new images meet your requirements, like the percentage of cloud coverage, and then send a notification. So whether you're sending over email or Slack or Twitter, um, even to your Apple Watch, we've seen that. So you saw in the transit map example, um, this was an example of pulling images on a schedule as well as in response to a trigger. And then the actual FME workspace was an integration with a live um, GIS data feed. So this URL here, um, can people actually go to that to take a look yes, at it? Yeah, yeah, so that's a short link, fme.ly slash sftransit, if you want to play with that. And then you saw the visual analysis example, too. Um, you can 
yeah, you can easily build a web, web page for your end users um, so they can pull images on demand whenever they want just by going to this web page that you build. So in FME 2018 beta, um, in the FME data inspector that uh, we used earlier to look at the output data, you'll be able to um, see your data over a planet base map. So right now we've got options like OpenStreetMap that you can use as a background. Um, in 2018, you'll actually be able to use up-to-date images from Planet. So we're pretty excited about that. And yeah, I guess that's it. So in summary, um, to use Planet imagery in your workflow, just start typing Planet on the canvas and put down a Planet reader. You can also use the feature reader if you want to do pre-processing. Um, either way, your parameters are going to look something like this. And you'll be able to specify exactly what you want to get. Add transformers like the raster expression evaluator or anything else that starts with raster, just start typing raster and you'll see um, to process and analyze the imagery however you want. And deploy your workspace to FME Cloud for good performance. And if you need to configure your workflow to launch automatically um, on a schedule or in response to an event. Um, so this is how you can make your workflow available to end users. So hopefully these demos inspired you um, as to what's possible and gave you what you need to know to get started. If you don't have FME yet, you can get it for free at safe.com slash trial. Um, and then we also have a home license if you are using it for non-commercial purposes. And then if you don't have an API key from Planet yet, you can also get that for free at planet.com. Um, please join us next week for the Back to FME School series. We're going to talk more about remote sensing um, and other cool demos and other topics as well. So we're going to, I think, open it up for questions now. Um, please keep typing them in the question box in GoToWebinar, and we'll get through a few of them. Um, yeah, thank you everyone so much for attending, and we'll unmute Alex now. Um, he can answer questions too, so thank you so much, Alex, for joining us. Let me just... Uh, unmute. Wait. Thank you. Unmute. Yeah, thank you oh. all for uh, having us. Awesome. Okay, so we have a lot of questions here. Okay. Yeah, I've been uh, trying to answer a few of them uh, okay. uh, through the chat. One one question around ocean data. Um, I'll just address that over over the mic if that's if that's okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the data itself right now is not it's not. Um, required or it's not acquired by request. Um, we're slowly rolling that out um, in specific locations, mostly around uh, popular ports or, you know, kind of like targeted areas of interest. Um, but it will eventually be rolled out across um, all, all regions, all coastal areas. The, the geolocation accuracy right now is roughly about a 10 to uh, 30 uh, RMS, RMSE, uh, RMSE, sorry. And um, but we are we are improving that accuracy as we as we kind of um, hone our techniques around um, open water rectification. So um, it does require obviously a, a very different rect uh, rectification technique than for land, um, but. We're, we're basically, it's an area of like research, but we are kind of rolling that out across different coastal areas. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I will type in my email as a, in response to your question. Yeah. Excellent, thanks. Um, what else can we answer here? Dimitri, please share the shown workspaces. Yes, we are going to share the workspaces afterwards. So you'll see in a follow-up email, um, we'll share the... Yes, we will share the workspaces, uh, except the video one, uh, which I also will share, but a little bit later, because I'm working on some really cool video examples right now. Or if you talk to me directly, I can share it instantly. Yeah, but they, they're just not, not as simple as, as the other ones. Was this one answered? Does PlanetScope capture and store images of areas regardless of cloud cover? I think it, yeah. yeah, we just saw an image with, yeah. with, with cloud. Yeah. Uh, that's why you need the, the filters, uh, the, uh, the JSON filters. Mm. 
Yeah, we do yeah. capture and store everything, but if once it exceeds a specific threshold, um, mostly if a certain percentage of the entire scene that we capture has has exceeded a certain threshold, um, and also we do we apply a score per pixel of every single scene of whether it's cloudy or not or or usable or not, which is what we use to generate the the unusable data mask. Um, if it exceeds a certain threshold, then we decide not to publish it. But most uh, most of that, a lot of that imagery is published. So the perfect example of this is um, if you look at, you know, more recently, if you look at areas in Houston um, or in Florida during the hurricane, uh, we didn't have imagery published right as uh, right during the hurricane because most of that area was just um, cloud, like every pixel was cloudy during that time. So we have plenty of before and after imagery, but in the in the in the um, climax of of that hurricane, when every single every pixel was virtually cloudy, we we didn't publish that imagery. We do capture it. So if we needed to go back and for whatever reason to pull that imagery, we can we can publish it. We just have to essentially adjust our filters, our pipeline filters. I think someone was asking, um, let me just, so someone was asking about um, the type of image. So I think, uh, let me just show, when you add a planet reader, um, you can choose the item type here. So you can choose the uh, satellite and then ortho tile um, scene vent. So have you, I've only ever used plant scope ortho tile. Um, can you maybe talk about the differences? Yeah. The the ortho tile is uh, we basically take our scene imagery, which is what um, our the frame imager and our satellites they they capture it as a strip and they break it up into individual scenes. So the the three band and four band scene, um, which is about twenty four kilometers by about sixteen kilometers, um, that scene is the the original kind of capture. Of, of the imagery. And then we reframe them into the rapid eye uh, UTM grid system. And so that's what we use to generate the ortho tile item. Um, so for those who are familiar with it, the reason why we did that was because a lot of our users, a lot of our customers were familiar with the rapid eye ortho tile, the UTM grid system. And so we, we took a lot of our scene imagery and then just reprojected it onto, um, onto the ortho tile format. But the data itself is the same. OK. Yeah. So we see a lot of questions coming. So if you, if you don't get a response right away, we will follow up, and you will mm -hmm. get the answer later uh, in, in an email. Yes. Someone was also asking about Matt Zen here, um, or the digital elevation models. You can choose the um, resolution if you go into the transformer. I guess in the, in the reader as well, you can probably choose what resolution you want. Yes, but uh, the coverage depends where in the world it is. So you get uh, better coverage for, for example, the United States, and maybe not uh, as good coverage for the remote remote parts of, of the planet. Uh, so, but it, it's a free uh, data set available through Amazon, and you can you can just go and try it uh, using either this transformer or our new reader, recently added reader, and see how good the coverage for uh, the area of your interest is. Okay. Yeah, and I do also notice that um, uh, someone's been asking um, about coverage over Nigeria. So yeah, I mean, we, we are imaging, uh, imaging everywhere on the planet. So we do have uh, coverage over Nigeria as well. Um, so if you go into, I'd encourage you to go into the Planet Explorer and you can, you can, it's a quick way to see where we have, you know, where we have coverage. Um, so I'm just like, I'm quickly just searching right now and I see that we have imagery as of, you know, a couple, couple weeks ago, or a couple days ago, actually. So, so yeah, we, we have imagery um, over it, um, all parts of Nigeria. Excellent. Okay, um, I think, should we call it there? And then if, I think most questions got answered. <laughs> um, 
if we didn't answer yours and you still need an answer, then uh, we also have the follow-up survey, so you can enter them in there, and we'll make sure that we uh, follow up with you. So, yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.